52 seconds of logos. Hey, it's Josh Holloway, which if Lost or Aerosmith videos have taught me anything, means he's a scoundrel and or a bad guy here. These guys completely miss him, but he hits both of them while falling. I don't know, I see a hot lady walking down an alley after I just did some super spy shit. I'd probably be suspicious, but maybe they don't teach the danger of boners at spy school. Wow, that text about this possible assassin actually killed him by distracting him from the actual assassin. Later we find out that Hannaway's fancy contacts recognize Sabine's face and send a message to his phone, which distracts him here and gets him killed. But later we find out he can see that without looking at his phone, so what the f***? Ethan Hunt is a dick to his sleeping cellmates. This prisoner is suddenly emboldened just because his cell door mysteriously opened. Why does he think he's got the upper hand? Why do some of these cells have one dude and others have two dudes? And this room has four dudes in it. This prison is making it up as it goes along. Ethan improvises to break out one of his buddies during a highly sensitive prison break plan. He's so confident in his skills, a massive chaotic fight in a tiny space doesn't worry him. And the ability to tow a completely untrained person back through it isn't given a second thought. As long as he's where he should be when the song ends. As the movie establishes, the song Ain't That a Kick in the Head is 2 minutes and 24 seconds, a duration which has already elapsed. Yeah, better not show how Ethan got out of this, because it would be bullshit anyway. Luckily, every prisoner on this level was absolutely ready and waiting by their doors as soon as it opened. Dean Martin's classic song ends 90 seconds after it was supposed to end. Also, there wasn't any real reason, other than pure sanity, logic, and reason, of course, that Ethan needed to be here when the song ended. There would have been no consequence to him being late, as long as Ethan continued to beat ass like he normally does, because the hole would have been waiting for him when he got there. Haha, <laughs> is this the fuse we'd see in a naked gun movie? Spoiler credits, Paula Patton is, damn, simply not my girlfriend. I'm a failure. What the fuck is he doing? It looked like he was trying to find Moreau, but he's just standing there, pointing his gun at nothing in particular. Moreau just left the scene, too. New intel suggests Cobalt is already en route, leaving you... 4 hours, 52 minutes. ...to infiltrate. 4 hours and 52 minutes to infiltrate the Kremlin. Sounds legit. So they went from Hi8 tapes to HD Oakley sunglasses to Kodak instant cameras to dirty-ass payphones with digital iPad screens. Jesus, IMF's mission delivery tech department is all over the place. Yeah, better make sure this message self-destructs. God knows how many people out there have Ethan's eyes, know the code he punched in, and could stumble on this payphone figuring out all sorts of secrets. Jesus Christ, why didn't you idiots just send Paula Patton in 10 minutes earlier and remove this tension completely? I think that went quite well. It's absolutely bonkers that the IMF didn't send another person with way more experience than Benji to be part of this team. We're talking nuclear launch codes here, priority number one on their list, and they send a guy who just recently became an agent. Any tech security camera companies can come up with is always instantly rendered moot with the placement of a simple device mirror or a can of spray paint. Oh good, they managed to bring a screen that is exactly the size of the opening of this Kremlin hallway. That's especially amazing since Benji and Jane didn't even know they were going to the Kremlin when they broke Ethan out of prison. Also, it's pretty fantastic that no one ever walks through here, that they can do this undetected from behind. Okay, this technology may be bullshit as hell, but I don't give a shit. The scene is tense, comical, and plot related, and I'm giving this movie two cents off for this stuff. Well, how many noises is this guy going to be distracted by? He just got back to his seat from investigating the last phantom noise. Have you made it to the archive room? How do you broadcast on all signals, including this Kremlin secure channel and the IMF secure channel? Ethan doesn't think much of this guy now, but is pretty sure Hendrix is behind all this when he turns the corner and sees the safe open. So why doesn't he follow him? This guy, of all people, would know where to go to be safe from the explosion. And Ethan's no slouch in the beating ass department. So it's extremely strange he lets this guy go. Hey, look, Tom Cruise is running fast again. Man, I'm starting to wonder if maybe he does this more than riding motorcycles in movies. Ethan outruns these explosions like he's the goddamn Starship Enterprise. Here's yet another explosion that merely knocks Ethan to one side or the other, instead of rightfully killing his fool ass. Ah, I see Ethan saw Terminator 2. A wire is somehow perfectly positioned coming out of this random spot of the hospital for Ethan to do this. Anna. How did this asshole and his henchmen get in here, grab the mom and kid, and make sure they didn't scream all without making noise themselves? European male. 50s, about 6 foot, 180 pounds. Blue eyes. Who is he? Well, that description and your crude hand drawing probably means only one person. It could be weeks before the Russians know what's missing, unless we tell them. They won't listen to us. Yeah, so it's better to just not tell them, because who believes in covering all bases? And why would the Russians do something smart, like changing their launch codes just in case the Americans might not be bullshitting them? As far as the Russians are concerned, we just bombed the Kremlin. But why? Because one American was found outside in the debris? Because it's still the Cold War? Because the plot demands it? The president has initiated ghost protocol. Roll credits. How does this miss them? Besides that, I thought bullets slowed down quite a bit when they hit water anyway. Today? Really? He escaped prison, then planned the Kremlin mission, then got knocked out from the explosion, then escaped the hospital and had this car ride with IMF peeps all in one day? Why would that work? Brant plays the pronoun game so that Ethan has to ask what that means. Flare on the body. What, why would that work? You might think we'd believe Brant would be excellent at cinema sins, but in this case, no. Of course the guys with guns would shoot at it. Why wouldn't they? Are they going to believe Ethan set up a dead body as a diversion? We would have sent it if they somehow knew not to shoot at it. 
Movie's attempt to defend itself in this case, even cheekily, is unnecessary. Retinal scan. Luckily, this thing has a couple handlebars right next to it, just in case you need to hold yourself steady while being scanned. Ethan? Why would Benji and Jane think anyone other than an IMF agent could get into this car with a f***ing retinal scanner outside? Why does this video look like something I used to play on the Sega CD back in the 90s? Intel indicates she will check into the Burj Hotel in Dubai in 36 hours. You would have thought it would have been difficult to find an assassin like her in two days, but she was as easy to find as Shaquille O'Neal in a sea of Peter Dinklage's. Also, why hasn't Moreau already sold these launch codes? She took them two days ago, and it's gonna be another couple of days before she sells them to Hendrix, because IMF agents always have time. We're shut down. No satellite safe house support or extraction. Only this super high-tech train with all the weapons and gear we could possibly need. That's all we have at our disposal. How do we keep them in separate rooms while having them think that they're in the same room? This is a question Brent actually asked back on the train while they were planning this mission, but they asked him to hold it until now for expositional purposes. Uh, uh, come on, Ethan didn't see that in the road. 34 minutes to door knock. Brandt sets his obvious iPhone down propped up against Benji's obvious MacBook Air to ensure perfect product placement feng shui. If you'd seen this zoom in and over the Burj Khalifa shot in IMAX like I did, you'd know exactly why I'm taking a sin off here. Are none of the people in these rooms reporting a man climbing outside their 120 plus story window? Glove begins to malfunction for the sake of the scene's tension. Ethan falls this far, but the movie glosses over his climb back up like it's f***ing nothing. By the way, despite having top-notch security in this room, Burj Hotel decides that no determined person could ever come through the glass and doesn't put an alarm on it. What happens with innocent people with rooms in this hotel get to their floor and find out they're on the wrong one? What if they decide to go up one floor and find out their floor has seemingly been erased from existence? Some sort of cable thingamabob just happens to be in the secure server area so that Ethan can escape. This is where a motherfucker is dead just from the impact alone. But of course, movie will sell that line of goods about people being able to catch a falling person without being pulled down themselves just because Jane grabs a piece of carpet. All of this in a split second of thought, by the way. Who is down with him? Let me get this straight. IMF was tracking Wistrom, knew his every move, and knew where he was coming today. But they didn't know that he had a Russian launch code verification guy with him. You guys knew exactly who you needed to make masks for, but you waited until the last minute to start the process. Why not on the train? Goggles. Ridiculously detail-oriented super spy Ethan Hunt forgets he has his goggles around his neck because he's going to need them later during the sandstorm scene. Earlier, we saw Benji changing the numbers on the doors so that the bad guys would go into the wrong room. But even though Benji has control of the elevators, there isn't any explanation that he can fool the elevator into displaying the wrong floor. This is from a movie that tells us every other aspect of the plan. Come on. First off, I know we can see it since the camera is getting an extreme close-up of his eye. But how can she from where she's sitting? Second off, slick super spy sh is somehow this easily detectable just by looking at it. These Russian guys basically derail Ethan's covert surveillance, which would be interesting if it wasn't completely f***ing unbelievable. That two rando Russian intelligence officers deduced that Ethan boarded a magic IMF train and ended up in mother f***ing Dubai. Does Dubai suddenly have a share all video surveillance treaty with Russia? This is a lazy excuse to let the guy Ethan's chasing know he's being chased, and nothing else. Fight gives character who wanted to murder someone for revenge a non-revenge reason to murder that person. This car is going fast enough to cause Ethan to break the windshield, but Ethan is made of titanium at this point, so it doesn't hurt him. Also, why the f*** would you drive that fast in a sandstorm when you can't see shit? Ethan bails out of a car going over 50 miles an hour and suffers no consequences. Even if he knows for a fact who you are after pulling off a piece of that mask earlier, What's the freaking point? The sandstorm knows where the drama's headed. Max's henchman from the first movie got out of prison and just happens to work for the one guy Ethan needs to give him information. And it's using the same covert traveling techniques. Brant's backstory super coincidentally involves Ethan Hunt and his supposedly dead wife, which is extra weird given how accidentally Brant came to be part of Ethan's current crew. I certainly cannot tell you that Russia quietly sold an obsolete technical satellite to a certain telecom in Mumbai. Ethan had to convince his prison buddy to convince this arms dealer to come to Dubai, and he just happens to have the exact information Ethan needs. It certainly couldn't have been any other arms dealer in the world who had this information. This entire operation relies on Jane being the hottest, most alluring woman at this party, which I admit is kind of hard to fault. But how do we know Halle Berry isn't wandering around? Or Selena Gomez? Did I say Selena Gomez? I meant Betty White. Sorry about that. Why am I Pluto? It's not even a planet anymore. Movie rips off and updates the Mr. Pink argument from Reservoir Dogs. Why is there a convenient tunnel for this thing to drive through from this electrical room? Impressed yet? For this scene's motivation, Paula Patton was forced to pretend her pop star husband had cheated on her, and she was after revenge. Saturn? Take to leap. By the way, why can't he do what Ethan did in the other Mission Impossible movies and just have some climber's cables and rappel down the tunnel? Couldn't he at least do that instead of jumping 25 feet to his possible death, then use the cool magnet thing later? All this thick metal everywhere, and that magnet thing still keeps Brant floating in the air. And not only that, there's a perfect path carved out for him to go anywhere he wants. It's downloaded a virus from the satellite. I thought Hendrix could only operate the satellite from this central server, but apparently he can just go uplink anywhere, send a virus from the satellite, and destroy the central server, and still have control of the damn thing. But the question is, if he can do that, why does he even need to do anything to that particular server? Wow, oh, this maneuver couldn't have been more convenient. Not only did he miss that killer turbine, it even bloomed closer to the ventilation shaft. <laughs> Bullshit. 
My frustration at seeing Ethan escape requires the undoing of my time. My relief at having escaped requires the undoing of my time. Lock Russia Central Command out of the system. Jesus, you can do everything from this Mumbai TV station, can't you? How long until Hendrix can launch a missile? Less than 30 seconds! That sounds like it will be impossible to stop, but didn't Hendrix already have launch capability when we last saw him? What the f*** does he have to wait for? Overly long launch sequence cliche. But didn't we just hear he could launch a missile in 30 seconds? Why are there all these extra time jumps before he can actually launch the missile? This guy calls a military submarine and gives some orders, and shockingly, the submarine follows them. Jesus, even in the hunt for Red October, the Russians had several checks and balances in place in terms of boat's orders. That's why Ramius had to kill the KGB officer. There has to be a way to abort the warhead. If there is one, it'll be on the launch device. And we're gonna get that case. I'm confused. Isn't the launch device the f***ing submarine where we literally saw dudes turn missile keys and launch the missile? Why is the case even called a launch device when he made a phone call to get that missile launched? Like I said, I'm confused. Get Wistrom inside, inside! Then she runs to the glass door and opens it to continue running, instead of shooting his legs through the glass immediately to take him down. Tom Cruise runs really fast past a bunch of motorcycles. This fight goes on far too long for one that includes Ethan Hunt and a really old pudgy dude. Honestly, I feel like I could have gotten this case by now. I know he's hurt, but it's like both of these guys are coated in butter during this entire scene. Brand forgets how to age it, and allows this dumbass in an easily detectable hiding place to get the drop on him. I mean, where did you think that guy was gonna be anyway? No! No! Obvious dummy is obvious. That is a terrible idea. And of course he survives. Shit, he should have just jumped. Airbags are not f***ing beanbag chairs. This clock is, of course, total nonsense. The fact that this guy has any life in him at all. This dickhead is shot square in the back, even though Benji is shooting from the side. Hospital? Why? You're Wolverine, aren't you? Your face doesn't have a mark on it after taking the brunt of an airbag deployment from a dead drop head-on crash with a concrete floor at many miles per hour. Whatever's broke now will have healed itself by the time you get to the hospital, right? Simply a meteor large enough to be visible during daylight. The f***? They got away with that cover story after it hit a f***ing building? In the age of surveillance and cell phone cameras and HD everything? Ving Rhames is given mere cameo status at the end of this movie. And if it hadn't been for dumb luck, was it? Yes, it was. So you had to fake your wife's death. As long as we're together, she can never be safe. I just don't see how that can be true. If you work at the CIA, aren't there all sorts of options to keep you protected? Plus, I don't know how you continue to do this kind of work if you're so easy to identify or locate. Surprise cameo is not really all that surprising if you've seen a couple of movies before. But, oh well, I'm glad they have this weird arrangement that doesn't make any sense, those crazy kids. Uh, we have a passenger. I'm a passenger. Now ride, now ride. No diamonds, no coats. No ticky, no laundry. House was cursed, she made us get a cow to get the curse reversed. It's just for the- Love the jet. Where do you see the car? Chicks love the car. It's a 25 foot drop, and we're using magnets. Yeah, bitch! Magnets! Take a big step back and literally fuck your own face! Don't burden yourself with the secrets of scary people. Welcome back to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? They're fueling their missiles! We don't have time to fuck around! We're fighting an army of robots. And I have a bow and arrow. None of this makes sense. <laughs> 